Okay, thank you, and thank you, Jan, and thank you, Natalia, for inviting me. So, first of all, uh, I will express my opinion and not necessarily the opinions of Nestle Purina. And these are my disclaimers. I have some research grants from various sources. I do some consultant work and some speaking engagement, but none of that should influence what I'm going to talk about today. But I will discuss off-label use of cholestyramine. This is a drug that is not li licensed for use in dogs. So for the outline of this talk, we are going to uh, discuss a case of a dog with chronic diarrhea, dysbiosis, and suspected bile acid diarrhea. And that's lovely folk that you see in the picture on the left. And then I'm going to talk about bile acid metabolism in health and disease, bile acid diarrhea in people, and bile acid diarrhea in dogs, which is a very novel topic. So we have very limited information, but we do have some interesting dogs that actually do respond to cholestyramine and they have fecal profiles that looks like bile acid diarrhea. So I'm going to share that with you, but first of all, Folke. So being a vet is a bit like being a parent. You're not supposed to have any favorites. You're supposed to treat everyone equally, but of course you do have favorites. And Folke is clearly one of my favorites. He's just the gentle, the most gentle dog you can find. So Folke, the first time I met him was six and a half years of age. He had been diagnosed with a chronic eosinophilic enteritis and lymphocytic plasmacytic colitis four years previously. And uh, he was referred to me due to a four months flare up of chronic non-responsive diarrhea and quite marked weight loss. He had lost six and a half kilo, so 22% of his body weight just over the summer. Before that, he had been reasonably stable on bedesonide, three mg every other day, and a high glyce soy-based diet for about two years prior to this long flare-up. And he's a boxer dog, so he has comorbidities, he has chronic intermittent pancreatitis, he has also quite marked atopy with pruritis, folliculitis, chronic otitis, pododermatitis. So for that, he's under treatment with allergen-specific immunotherapy and three mig methylprednisolone every third day on top of the budesonide, because this budesonide is really not very good for treating um, skin condition. That budesonide is locally active in the gut, as you know. And he has also had multiple urinary tract infections, and especially when increasing the corticosteroids. So during this long flare-up, his uh, budesonide dose had been increased and it helped slightly, but only slightly. And also the methylprednisolone dose had been increased, but that didn't really help very much. But it caused him to have several urinary tract infections. He'd also been treated with olsalacin against colitis, uh, and he tried a multi-strain probiotic. So that's slab 51, none of that helped. The referring vet had put him on uh, pancreatic enzymes uh, while waiting for the TLI results because she was thinking that maybe he had developed exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, but he had no effect of that. He had tried two high glass diets. He was put on the second one a few weeks before I saw him. He had tried a highly digestible diet and also a homemade balanced potato on whitefish diet. And he's also tried um, added fibers and that had, none of that had much of an effect. And when I'm seeing him, he's also on cobalamin because his level was slightly low uh, two weeks prior, and he has just stopped amoxicillin for a urinary tract infection. And his faces before the flare up looked like this. I do find these fecal scoring charts really helpful when assessing a patient because some dog owners only think that abnormal stool is number seven, everything else is normal. Whereas other dog owners find that if the dog has stool of number four out of seven on this chart, they are almost in tears. So it's really helpful when talking to dog owners to use these fecal scoring charts. So before the flare up, he was between two to three out of seven, but now he has faces like four to six, um, oh, sorry, five to six out of seven every day. And he has, He's defecating four to six times per day as well, and often during nighttime. Uh, if we, we look at hematology and serum biochemistry, these are fairly recent, uh, just before I saw him. So he has slightly low hematocrit and hemoglobin. The six and a half year old boxer should have higher hematocrit. 
Total protein is just on the lowest end of the range, just, just below that, but that's otherwise this looks rather unremarkable. The GI panel, we can see that his uh, canine pancreatic lipase is elevated. So it's in the so-called gray zone. So it could be chronic pancreatitis or acute pancreatitis, or it could be just a GI inflammation. And here we can see the cobalamin uh, concentration. This is European units, but as you can see, it's very close to the lowest end of the reference range. So we had started him, or he had been started on cobalamin before I saw him. Folate and TLI is normal. He doesn't have any parasites. And this is a urine sample taken the same day as I saw him. And he doesn't have any active um, inflammation or infection any longer. So this is a really skinny dog with severe diarrhea. He's almost three out of nine in body condition score. But yeah, you could also say he's a two out of nine. So normally I only do one thing at a time because I want to know if things go wrong, what we can blame. So if we do two things at the same time, we don't know if things get worse, which of the new treatments that actually didn't have an effect or actually had an adverse effect. But uh, because of Folker's condition, his multiple urinary tract infections, his low body condition score and his high disease activity, I'm actually doing two things at the same time. So I'm adding a second line immunosuppressive, so that's cyclosporine, and we are scheduling him to receive fecal microbiota transplantations, also because of the uh, many courses of antibiotics he's had. So typically we give uh, FMT at three different occasions, and we usually have two to three weeks interval between the treatments. So, with treatment of both cyclosporine and FMT, he increases one and a half kilo of body weight, not a lot, but it's still a positive thing. So now his body condition score is three out of nine. Every time he gets an FMT, he has a normalization of his feces, but it only lasts for like two to six days. So there's no lasting effect and it doesn't build up. So if he gets after the second or the third FMT, there's no change, the effect doesn't last. He defecates most night, which is diff difficult for the dog owners. And he has one more urinary tract infection because he's still on a lot of uh, budesonide. And he's also started to vomit much more frequently. I see him for a scheduled checkup again, three months after the first visit. And now he has increased three kilo of body weight, so that's good. His body condition score is now four out of nine, but the dog owner has, yeah, so the feces is now improved. The fecal quality is between three to four out of seven on the fecal chart. The dog owner has actually stopped the cyclosporine 30 days before I saw him. And that's because she believes he has GI side effects, which is quite common with cyclosporine, at least in my experience. So he's vomiting much more frequently. And also he has more diarrhea when she gets the cyclosporine. And she noted that because she forgot to give it for a few days and then those clinical signs stopped and came back when she gave him cyclosporine again. So she decided to stop the cyclosporine. Canine pancreatic lipase at this time point has increased from 360 to 1468. So it's much higher now. Yeah, we shouldn't treat the number, but it's not a good sign according to me, but he's doing better. His atopy and skin condition is much worse, no wonder, because he stopped the cyclosporine. So we have to start him on oclacitinib to stop those signs and the pruritus. And we start to taper the corticosteroids slowly. So it's on three mg bedesonide once daily and methylprednisolone four mg every other day. And I start to give bedesonide three days out of four first and then two days out of three instead. And I'm a bit worried that the improvement we have seen in his body weight and um, Fecal scores is due to the cyclosporine, but that the effect will actually wean off now when he's not on the cyclosporine any longer. But I fully agree that he should not be on a drug that cause him severe side effects. So I discussed other li second line immunosuppressives, but the dog owner wants to do nothing at this time point since he is improving and I support that. But I'm a bit afraid that things will get worse and they do. This is six weeks later and this is Volker defecating at home. So you can see that his uh, muscle atrophy is quite pronounced still. His skin is not looking good and feces is clearly not looking good. About this time, I get some interesting ba uh, results back from the GI lab. So I had sent samples quite recently, both from the time point 
around his FMG and then quite recent samples. So I have the dysbiosis index here. And as you probably remember, a normal dog with a normal microbiota should have an index below zero. And then we can have mild dysbiosis and that's between zero and two and significant dysbiosis over two. So in November, 2020, which is at the time point of the second FMT, he has clearly significant dysbiosis but he's had several courses of antibiotics as well. So we can't say if it's just the GI disease or the antibiotics, most likely it's both. Because in March, 2021, which is about this time, he still has significant dysbiosis, although improved, which may be due to the fact that he hasn't had antibiotics for a while and has been a bit more stable in his GI tract. So quick uh, recap of the dysbiosis index. So this index uh, was made up from the total amount of bacteria and then seven different bacterial taxa that typically differ between dogs with chronic entropathy and healthy dogs. And there are some really complicated mathematical calculations behind that, that you can see uh, on your right upper hand. So typically what we see is that in dogs with chronic entropathy, we have lower amount of total bacteria, lower fecalibacterium, lower Teresibacter, increased levels of E. coli and Streptococcus, lower amount of Lausia and Fusobacterium and Clostridium heronomis. And the purple ones are short chain fatty acid producing bacteria that produce a lot of things beneficial for GI health, such as anti-inflammatory, they have an anti-inflammatory effect. They also improve the tight junctions and they do a lot of other things too for GI health. And then Clostridium heronomis at the bottom, converts primary bile acids to secondary bile acids, which is important in bile acid metabolism. And if that doesn't work, we can have bile acid diarrhea. So we did a retrospective study in dogs that we treated with FMT. So typically dogs like Folke that didn't respond to uh, the treatment they were on or didn't respond fully. However, the dogs that were included were not allowed to have two treatments changed at the same time. So these dogs, these are only some of them. These are the ones I had baseline fecal samples from. But the dogs that were included were not allowed to both have an FMT and start a new treatment. So Folke is not included in this retrospective study. However, if we look at responders to FMT compared to non-responders, we found a significant difference. So the responders had significantly lower uh, dysbiosis index at baseline compared to the non-responders. And if we look at the range, then the responders, several of these dogs were actually having a normal uh, index and the mean for the responders was 1.5. So that's in the mild dysbiosis index, whereas the mean for the non-responders was 4.2. And most of the non-responders had significant dysbiosis. If we break it down to the different classes, we can see that 21% of the dogs that were responders had a normal biosis. If you look at the responders in the graph, you can see that there's actually two dots now representing two dogs that are red. And that's because these dogs had a normal index, but they had two, one or two uh, individual taxa that were outside the reference range. And that's also a sign of mild dysbiosis. So three of these dogs had normal biosis and only one dog in the non-responding group had normal biosis. Mild dysbiosis was seen in 43% of the uh, responders, but only 11% of the non-responders. And significant dysbiosis was seen in 36% of the responders, but 78% of the non-responders. If we go back to Folke, uh, this is his Clostridium heronomis. Uh, in November 2020 at the time of his second FMT. So the gray zone is the reference range. So he has a low amount of Clostridium heronomis, which could be due to antibiotics because that's a common side effect, but it could also be due to his severe GI disorder. And in March 2021, Clostridium heronomis has normalized, so that's good, but he still has diarrhea. If we look at percentage of primary bile acids, at the time point of the second FMT, his primary bile acids, the percentage of those is super high, so over 90%, and the gray zone here still represents the reference range. So a normal dog should have 
the percentage of primary bile acids should be up to 15 about. And in March 2021, which is uh, when he's getting worse, then he still has a percentage of primary bile acids over 80%, so about 85%. And to me, this looks like bile acid diarrhea. So the basics of bile acid is that they're really detergent molecules produced by the liver to break down fat and also to help the body to absorb fat. So the bile acids will be released from the liver in response to a fatty meal and then break down the fat. And then in the ileum, about 95% of the bile acids will be reabsorbed uh, via the enterohepatic circulation. And then about 5% will enter the colon. After ileal absorption, the majority of the remaining primary bile acids will be converted to secondary bile acids by Clostridium hironones. And then after conversion, we will have mostly secondary bile acids. And that's depicted with this purple washing up liquid bottle instead of the green one. There will be a small amount of primary bile acids that will remain unconverted in the gut lumen. You can see the tiny green bottle here. The secondary bile acids have a lot of good effects on GI health. So the secondary bile acids suppress proliferation of E. coli, Clostridium fringens, Clostridium difficile, but also inflammatory mediators like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1 beta, and interleukin-6. So the secondary bile acids have an anti-inflammatory effect and also regulate the intestinal microbiota. But actually bile acids don't only affect the gut. They also infect the entire body. One way to do that is that bile acids are required to absorb and distribute and metabolize and excrete drugs. But the secondary bile acids are also important in regulation of, of metabolic, metabolic homeostasis, and that's to prevent hypoglycemia, dyslipidemia, obesity, and diabetes mellitus. And that's a talk by itself. But the secondary bile acids are important for several aspects apart from just what's happening in the gut. If we look a bit more in detail on the synthesis of bile acids, so the building brick is cholesterol. And the rate limiting enzyme for this process is the CYP7A1 or cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase. When this enzyme has reacted with cholesterol, the net result will be 7-alpha-hydroxy-4-colosine-3-1, which is also called C4. And C4 is important because that can be measured in a blood test uh, as a measurement of bile acid synthesis. And then further conversion will occur using different enzymes until we have the net product cholic acid and keno the oxycholic acid, which is our both primary bile acids. And then there's a minor pathway, an acidic pathway, so we can also synthesize kinodeoxycholic acid via this other pathway, but that's a minor pathway. Once cholic acid and kinodeoxycholic acid has been synthesized, they are conjugated with taurine or glycine, which makes them more hydrophilic. And then we have a nice detergent that can be excreted from the liver in response to a meal. And most of it will be reabsorbed in the ileum, as we talked about before. And the, about 5% that will enter the colon will meet the intestinal microbiome, typically Clostridium heronones. And the Clostridium heronones will convert the primary bile acids to secondary bile acids, such as the oxycholic acid, lifocholic acid, ursodioxycholic acid, and others. Regulation of this uh, system is quite sophisticated and quite complicated, but I will try to walk you through this. So the uh, Bile acids will be absorbed in the ileum via the apical sodium dependent bile acid transporter. And then the bile acids will bind it to the FXR or Farnesoid X receptor. And this will have several effects. So the ASBT protein will be downregulated and FGF19 synthesis will be uh, induced. And then FGF19 will be released in the bloodstream and enter the hepatocytes via the portal venous system. And FGF19 will bind to FGF4R, and which will activate the FXR of Arnosoid X receptor. And the net effect of that 
will be decreased absorption of bile acids and decreased synthesis of bile acids. So the enzymes used to synthesize bile acid for cholesterol will be downregulated. So FGF19 has a negative feedback on absorption and synthesis of bile acids. And FGF19 can also be measured as one tool to estimate bile acid diarrhea and uh, production rate. So in bile acid diarrhea, the main problem is that we have a defective enterohepatic circulation. So if you look at the green liquid up, uh, washing up liquid bottle here, we can see that actually it's not possible to absorb it because we have inflammation. So the most common reasons for defective enterohepatic circulation is malabsorption due to typically inflammation, could be cancer as well, and dysbiosis. And we can, of course, have both at the same time. So if you look at the microbiota in this picture, it's actually now depleted. So now we are lacking Clostridium heronionis. And the effect of that is that we can't convert primary bile acids to secondary bile acids as we're supposed to. So we will have a larger pool of primary bile acids uh, and a smaller pool of secondary bile acids. There are other mechanisms as well, such as defective feedback inhibition of bile acid synthesis, genetic variations of apical sodium binding uh, transport, upregulation of membrane bound uh, bile acid receptors, etc. But the major ones, the ones that are good to remember, are malabsorption and dysbiosis. So the net effect will be increased amount, total amount of bile acids if we can't absorb the bile acids, or increased amount of primary bile acids in the colon. And this will have several effects. This will stimulate electrolyte and water secretion. This will increase mucosal permeability and colonic motility. And it will also stimulate defecation, mucus secretion, and lead to mucosal damage. So for the patient, and we're now talking about humans, this is typically shown as watery diarrhea. Urgency to go to the bathroom, bloating, nightly diarrhea is very common, soiling accidents, which is uh, not very nice pain and attacks of abdominal cramping. And bile acid diarrhea is prevalent in people. So studies have shown that up to 40% of people with Crohn's disease are suffering from bile acid diarrhea as a consequence of the underlying condition, so the inflammation of the ileum. And if we look at patients with Crohn's disease that has been through ileal resection, then 90% of those are suffering from bile acid diarrhea. But even a condition like irritable bowel syndrome, when there's no inflammation, uh, even those patients are affected with bile acid diarrhea if they are suffering from irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea. So up to 30% of those people uh, are affected with bile acid diarrhea. And in total, it is estimated to, that about 1% of the total population is affected with bile acid diarrhea. So bile acid diarrhea is prevalent, but it's also underdiagnosed. So it's regarded as an underdiagnosed and undertreated condition. As you can see in the, the paper at the bottom, and um, there are other papers like that. And the biggest reason why it's underdiagnosed is mainly due to the lack of diagnostic tools. Because both for us as vets and human doctors, if we can't diagnose it or if it's difficult to diagnose it, it may not exist. So we forget about it because it's not that easy to diagnose. The gold standard method is this CCAT method, which uh, measures retention of bile acids in the body and can be further um, classified as severe, moderate, or mild bile acid malabsorption. The CCAT method is not available in all countries, such as the US. It's never been available in the US. It involves radioactivity. And even in countries where it is available, it's really difficult to, to get one of these tests done. So then there are zero markers such as C4 and FGF19. So they are an indirect measurement of bile acid synthesis, but they are not as good as the CCAT test, especially not FGF19. And then the newest addition is fecal bile acids. In people, that means that they have to have a high fat diet for four days, and then they should have a 48 hour collection period, collection all, uh, collecting all the feces they produce, which is not very popular, but the um, fecal bile acid test is a good one, so it is comparable to the CCAT test. But because of the lack of diagnosis tools, 
clinicians are often reverted to using diagnostic treatment with cholestyramine. And that's far from ideal because it won't give you an accurate diagnosis of bile acid diarrhea. And maybe that's not a very important, you could think that, but uh, it's very common with side effects of cholestyramine. So in order to have um, a proper diagnosis, you may actually need that proper diagnosis because if you have side effects of the cholestyramine, you may not go back to your doctor and say that maybe I should try a second generation bile acid sequestrant that is more expensive. Because you, if you know you have this disease, then you're more likely to actually ask for the next treatment. If we look at treatment, then cholestyramine is the first line treatment, as already mentioned. Cholestyramine is a strong ion exchange resin. So it will exchange the chloride iron with anionic bile acids. And this means that the bile acids will be strongly bound into this resin matrix. And this complex is insoluble. So this insoluble complex is formed in the gut and excreted in the feces, which means that we can't reabsorb the bile acids. They are bound in this matrix. So this counter affects the, uh, counteracts the effects of high amounts of bile acids in the, uh, in the colon. Cholestyramine is licensed as a cholesterol lowering agent, so it's used off label for bile acid diarrhea, even if it's been used off label for since the 70s, but it's still not licensed to use for bile acid diarrhea. The recommendation is to start with a low dose. Uh, once daily and then increase the dose weekly until an effect is seen or until uh, the, you actually stop the treatment because there is no effect. So typically after one week, you can increase the dose to twice, uh, two times per day and then three times per day and then increase each of the doses further. And this is done to re uh, have lower amount of side effects because side effects are common. Cholestyramine is unpalatable and it has to be taken uh, in this powder form uh, mixed with uh, liquid or mixed with food. Treatment response is associated with the degree of bile acid malabsorption using the CCAT test. So if patients have severe bile acid malabsorption, 96% of them will respond to cholestyramine. In patients with uh, moderate bile acid malabsorption, 80% of those will respond to cholestyramine. And in patients with mild bile acid diarrhea, the 70% of those will respond to cholestyramine. There aren't not that many studies actually uh, looking at cholestyramine and the placebo, but there are a few. And in this study by Fernandez Banares from 2015, they had patients with uh, IBS with diarrhea and they were treated either with cholestyramine or with cellulose. So cellulose is not a placebo. Cellulose has excellent water binding properties. So actually some of these patients actually responded to the cellulose as well, but more patients responded to cholestyramine than cellulose. So the patients treated with cholestyramine had significantly lower amount uh, of stools per day and significantly fewer watery stools per day compared to cellulose in that study. If you're using cholestyramine, you should um, think about if any other drugs are prescribed to the patient, which is very common because that should not be given at the same time. As mentioned before, then bile acids are important for um, circulation and uptake of drugs. And if we bind the bile acids with cholestyramine, then we may not have an effect of the other drugs. So if other drugs are used, they should be given one hour before or four to six hours later. Side effects are very common. Over 50% of people that start cholestyramine stop the treatment within one year, even if they get clinically better regarding the diarrhea. And typical side effects are bloating and pain, nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia, flatulence, borborygmia, constipation, and worsening of diarrhea. High doses has been associated with coagulopathies if used long-term, but those doses are really high, so that's 24 grams per day. And one of these sachets, as you see in this picture, is uh, of four grams. So that's six of those sachets per day, which is a super high dose. But there are a few side effects uh, and case reports reporting uh, coagulopathies using such high doses. And 11 out of 67 healthy volunteers in one study developed a three-time increase of ALT. That was considered a benign increase because there were no other signs of hepatotoxicity. And when cholestyramine was stopped, the ALT normalized again. 
So what do we do about bile, uh, know about bile acid diarrhea in dogs then? In 2016, Kent and co-workers published this paper in Veterinary Record Open, where they measured 7 alpha hydroxy 4 cholestine 3 1 or C4 uh, in serum of dogs. So this is the first study looking at C4. So they measured C4 in serum in 17 dogs with chronic diarrhea and 20 healthy dogs. And just a quick recap here that C4 is this intermediate step in bile acid synthesis from cholesterol. So this is what they measured. And in three out of seven dogs with chronic diarrhea, those dogs had significantly higher concentrations in serum of C4 compared to healthy dogs. And all of these three dogs were poorly responsive to standard therapy for chronic entropathy. And one of them was treated with cholesteramine, but that dog also had a change of diet about the same time. So it was impossible to say if it actually was the diet change or responding to cholesteramine that improved the dog. Two years later, Paolo Giaretta and co-workers published this really interesting paper where they looked at 24 dogs with chronic inflammatory entropathy and 11 control dogs. And they looked at this transport protein, so uh, apical sodium dependent bile acid transporter, and they stained specifically for that. So you can see uh, in picture A, the brown lining of the villi, that's the ASBT. And in picture B, we see a villi from a dog with chronic inflammatory entropathy. And you can see that the outer brown, brown lining is now almost gone. So very little ASBT left in this picture. They also looked at fecal bile acids. And if they looked at the total fecal bile acid pool, there was no difference in control dogs and dogs with chronic inflammatory entropathy. But when they looked at the percentage of secondary versus pri uh, primary bile acids, there was a significant difference. So to the left in this graph, you see the control dogs, they have almost exclusively secondary bile acids. But the dogs with chronic inflammatory entropathy had a much higher proportion of primary bile acids than secondary bile, uh, bile acids compared to uh, the, the healthy ones. So dogs with chronic inflammatory entropathy had significantly higher percentage of primary bile acids compared to healthy dogs. And they also looked at fecal disposes index, the same index, and not surprisingly, dogs with chronic inflammatory entropathy had a significant disposes compared to healthy dogs. And then Blake Garden care workers, including me, uh, published this paper in 2019, looking at healthy dogs and dogs with uh, chronic entropathy responding to corticosteroids. So first here we see uh, the percentage of secondary bile acids of the total amount. And in the graph, you see healthy dogs to the left. And baseline means baseline in the dogs with chronic steroid responsive entropathy before corticosteroids when they were doing the worst. And the sec uh, percentage of secondary bile acids is significantly higher in healthy dogs compared to these dogs with chronic inflammatory entropathy. But when they were treated with corticosteroids, the amount of, or the percentage of secondary bile acids increased over time. So it almost became normal again after two to three months of corticosteroids. You can see that the uh, secondary bile acids, the percentage of those uh, to the far right most of these dogs are now between 80 and 100 percent secondary bile acids but there are a few that don't normalize and you can see there the three of uh, ones down at the bottom there and uh, when we looked at clostridium hironones the amount of clostridium hironones normalized over time as well so the abundance of clostridium hironones increased over time with corticosteroid treatment but not in all dogs and the three dogs down there, they are the same dogs as the one having very little uh, or low percentage of secondary bile acids. And those were dogs that I treated. And one of them had protein losing entropathy and was quite difficult to control, very uh, required high doses of corticosteroids. One of them were lost to follow up afterwards. And one was a dog that lived for several years, but had severe long lasting flare up that were really difficult to get uh, control of. And then last year, we published this case report in two dogs that really didn't respond to anything else or to anything at all until I gave them cholesteramine. 
So Sora to the left, he had had diarrhea for more than one year. This dog had a chronic lymphocytic plasmacytic enteritis that had been stable, fairly stable for a few years and then got much worse. Responded to really high doses of corticosteroid, but nothing else. And when I tried several second line immunosuppressives, didn't respond to FMT, didn't respond to probiotics or fiber or dietary changes, but had a significant effect of cholesteramine that stopped the diarrhea. And Koba to the right uh, had had a flare up of diarrhea every week for all his life, and he didn't respond to anything not corticosteroids, uh, not cyclosporine, not metronidazole, not um, probiotics, not prebiotics, and he had a very poor appetite. Had some effect of the first FMT, but had a, a, re a relapse and then no effect at all of the second and the third FMT. And he had a beautiful response to cholesteramine as well. At the time point when this study was published, then we didn't have the results of primary and secondary fecal bile acids because this was in the beginning of COVID and it was almost impossible to ship fecal sample frozen to the US. But I do have those results now and from a few other bile acid uh, cholestyramine responding dogs. So I'm going to share that with you in the next uh, two slides, but these data are not published yet. So you see some of the bile uh, cholestyramine responders at the bottom. And in each graph, we have responders to the left and non-responders to the right. So if we look at fecal primary bile acids, we can see that uh, the dogs responding to cholestyramine have a significant higher amount of fecal primary bile acids compared to the non-responders. So here we have 15 dogs in total, and nine of these are bile acid sequestrant responders, and six of them are non-responders. So all of them had chronic diarrhea. If we look at the percentage of fecal primary bile acids, the difference is even bigger. So as you can see, looking at the responders, then seven out of nine of these dogs had a percentage of fecal primary bile acids of 80 to 100%, which is a lot. But the non-responders were mostly within the uh, normal reference range. And of the responders, only one dog was in the reference range. If we look at the total fecal bile acid, there is no significant difference. So looking at the total, total bile acid synthesis is uh, not a good way to distinguish the responders from the non-responders, that's the worst tool. So I don't think we would have much information by just looking at the total fecal bile acids. If we look at Clostridium hironones, uh, the responders have a significantly lower amount of Clostridium hironones. Some of them have a normal amount, but um, the Median here is 1.8, so really low, whereas the median in the non-responding group is 6.7. And none of the non-responders um, have a low amount of Clostridium here uh, known as. If we look at the dysbiosis index, it's significantly higher in dogs responding to cholestyramine or uh, bile acid sequestrants. One of these dogs didn't respond to cholestyramine, but did respond to um, second line bile acid sequestrants. So typically the dogs responding to bile acid sequestrants have a much higher dysbiosis index than the non-responders, even if there are a few responders that are having mild dysbiosis or actually no dysbiosis, so no meiosis. So back to Folke that I suspected had bile acid diarrhea because he had about 85% of primary bile acid synthesis. So we started him on cholestyramine 60 mg per kg once daily, and then I increased to 60 mg per kg twice daily after a week to reduce side effects. He had no side effects, and this is what the feces looked like. This is very uh, short time after starting cholestyramine. This is about seven or eight days after starting it. So his dog owner was so happy. She could take him into town again. She could live their life as they should. She didn't have to plan for him having diarrhea all the time, and she didn't have to go out in the middle of the night. So are the, what are the dose recommendations for dogs uh, using cholestyramine then? There are actually a few published doses. So in the BSAVA drug manual from 2011, it is recommended to use 500 to 2000 mg per dog twice daily to reduce hypercholesterolemia. 
And there's a dose of 170 mg per kg once daily for cyanobacterial toxicosis. And this is the case report in a dog that was severely ill from cyanobacterial toxicosis and wouldn't have survived without a cholestyramine. And actually, cholestyramine can be used for intoxication. So uh, also uh, from NSAIDs, from sargopalm, and a few other uh, substances as well. Because if we block, block the bile acids, it's not uh, possible to uh, reabsorb the drug. So that can in, uh, increase the speed of getting rid of the um, intoxicating substance. Uh, I've used 60 mg per kg twice daily uh, in the bile acid diarrhea report, but I have used um, doses slightly higher than that as well. So I've done the same thing as is recommended for people. Start with once daily, then increase to twice daily after one week, and then increase the dose slowly until the effect. And the effect is usually seen really quickly, so typically within days. So what you often see is, uh, if you give it once daily, is that one, after you have given it, they are fine for about 6 to 8 to 12 hours, and then diarrhea comes back. But when you start giving it twice daily, then diarrhea stops. But if you give too low dose to start with, then you won't see anything until you have increased the dose. Are there any coagulopathies in dogs then? And actually there's an old study from 1964 looking at that. So they gave various doses of cholestyramine and then looked for coagulopathies. Um, and only when they gave really massive doses of 3,000 mg per kg. So that's almost one of those such as per kg dog. If they gave that, they could note a coagulopathy that was mild. So it's not very likely with the doses we use that the uh, patient is going to have coagulopathies, but I would still check your bleeding times before or clotting times before going uh, to surgery in one of these patients. Certain drugs may need dose adjustment, and that's typically increasing the dose because we won't have the same absorption if we use cholestyramine. So typically phenobarbiton, uh, NSAIDs, and micro, uh, microphenolate. And I've used the same recommendation as in people. So if you have other drugs uh, to the patient, give them one hour before or fix four to six hours later. My personal experience is that some dogs have mild vomiting when starting on this drug, and that's typically vomiting once or twice during the first week, not showing signs of nausea, still wanting to eat. And uh, I've only seen a few um, dogs that has vomited. Uh, uh, worsening of diarrhea, we have seen that with non-responders, and then it's not very tasty. So for a large breed dog on uh, corticosteroids, typically they eat anything, so that's not a problem. But for a really tiny dog with hyperexia or anorexia as the main clinical sign, that can be a problem. It can be really difficult for them to take cholestyramine. So what you can do at that time, that's uh, putting cholestyramine in empty gelatin capsules, uh, and that's one way of trying. And second line, uh, bile acid sequestrants are not that unpleasant, but then there are less evidence for that. There is a potential risk of taurine deficiency, possibly. It's shown that cholestyramine has a higher affinity for bile acids conjugated with taurine than glycine. Uh, so maybe it could happen, we don't know. And I would be more concerned in cats than in dogs. So Folke did really, really well. And two months later, he was back for a recheck. We had been in contact over the phone. And at this time, apparently he's doing great. He's much more alert. Uh, he has gained five kilos of body weight since the first examination. So he's gained further weight after starting cholestyramine. And his dog owner is saying that the old Folke is back. He defecates about five times per day and not during... Uh, nighttime any longer and he has normal stool besides about one afternoon every other week otherwise he has normal stool and his canine pancreatic lipase has decreased still elevated but not up to almost 1500 as before and he seems to be doing really well and i should also say that this picture of Folke that you saw from the beginning this is when he's doing better. So I always find it difficult to ask dog owners of a really super skinny dog that I have never met before to ask them for a picture the first time I see them. So I don't have a picture of what he looked like when he was the worst, but I have one that I will show you at the end that the owners uh, provided me with. But then 
it uh, was summertime and summer is a difficult time period for him. This is last year. So in September 2021, when he was back, he was doing worse. He had a flare up that had been lasting since the summer months uh, and he had a fictive quality that varied a lot. He had mild vomiting and he has now lost one kg of body weight again. And his fecal score is now varying from four to six and it defecates four times a day, still only during daytime. So it's not as bad as he was initially, but he's not super. And canine's pancreatic lipase is in the same range. Cholesterol has now decreased, which is possibly because the dog owner had tried to increase the cholesterol into three times daily, had no effect on the diarrhea. But if we give cholesterol, we bind bile acids, and then we can uh, decrease uh, the concentration of cholesterol in serum. She has also tried to increase the budesonide, and that caused a slight improvement, but not to the same extent as we would like to. So at this time point, we tried mycophenolate instead. So we started with 12 mg per kg once daily, and later tapered that dose to two days in a row, and no uh, mycophenolate day number three. And that had a really good effect on him. And this is September this year. This is from uh, the same occasion. So He's doing really well. He has only mild flare-ups uh, during the last summer. And during those flare-ups, he had responded to increasing budesonide to once daily and cholesterol uh, to um, giving it three times daily instead of two times daily. So with these mild flare-ups, he did respond to increasing cholesterol and budesonide when he was treated with mycophenolate at the same time. And he has had an additional increase of body weight with 4.5 kilos. So he's now uh, looking really nice, like a boxer dog should do, muscular, lots of stamina, lots of activity. And he's on a maintenance days of bedesonide, three mig um, every other day, cholestyramine two days out of three. No, sorry, <laughs> cholestyramine twice daily, a microphenolate two days in a row, and then none for the third day. Allergen specific immunotherapy and oclacitinib. And he defecates three to four times a day, only during daytime, and his fecal score is varying from two to four out of seven. And his canine pancreatic lipase is in the gray zone. It's only very mildly elevated, and it's been like that since we started him on mycophenolate, which is interesting. There are some evidence in people with autoimmune pancreatitis that mycophenolate can actually be beneficial instead of corticosteroids in people um, that don't respond well to corticosteroids. And uh, Folke clearly had a very good effect regarding his canine pancreatic lipase levels uh, with mycophenolate. And cholesterol is in the normal reference range. So he's doing super. When should we try bile acid sequestrants in dogs? And I put the question marks there because we don't really know at this time point but my limited experience of this is that you should always do your routine evidence-based workup and treatment first, because this is not a very common condition. You should try the multiple dietary changes, evidence-based probiotics, prebiotics, and immunosuppressives and fecal microbiota transplantation first before you try bile acid sequestrants. And you should also take some screening of the fecal profile that I will get back to in a minute. Possible, uh, possible indications are dogs with non-responsive chronic diarrhea and persistently marked dysbiosis, lack of Clostridium heronones, and or increased percentage of primary bile acids. Or dogs with no response to FMT or a quick relapse of diarrhea post-FMT. So the best combination is if you both have no response to FMT or quick relapse of diarrhea post FMT and you have a low clostridium heronones or marked dysbiosis that doesn't disappear with the treatment you are getting you know, or giving to the dog. Another indication is dogs that require really high concentrations of corticosteroids and don't respond to second line immunosuppressants, like Soro, the uh, Rottweiler that responded to really high doses of corticosteroids, but nothing else worked for him. So that's one of the dogs in the case report. And uh, the doses of corticosteroids we had to give him was high enough to give him uh, calcinosis cutis. Because corticosteroids can increase apical sodium dependent bile acid transporter, 
uh, in rats and healthy people. So if you give corticosteroids, you actually may increase the ability for the body to absorb the bile acids in the ileum. At least that's shown in dogs and rats, and, oh, sorry, in people and rats, and it may be the same in dogs. After ileal resection, uh, that's standard therapy in people, because if you remove the ileum, you remove the place where the bile acids can be reabsorbed. And we have good experience of that in a dog where we had to remove 70 centimeters of the intestine, including the ileum. We thought that that would be really difficult afterwards. We started the dog on cholestyramine uh, after uh, surgery and the dog had no diarrhea at all. And we have been able to wean off the cholestyramine over time. So this is Folke in July 2020. This is uh, just before I saw him in September 2020 the first time. And he looks like a lanky teenager, but he's six and a half. He shouldn't look like that. He has no shoulder muscles almost. His chest is really thin. His skull is really thin as well. And this is Folke really recently. Both of these pictures were taken by the dog owner. And he's actually 37 kilos. He's not overweight, but he's, uh, he's looking like a boxer dog should do. And he's doing so well. So this is Folke waiting for his treats after the visit. So in conclusion, bile acid diarrhea is a consequence of defect enteropathic circulation plus minus dysbiosis. This is prevalent and underdiagnosed in people and it appears to exist in dogs too. And persistently marked dysbiosis, lack of clostridium hironones and or a very high percentage of primary bile acids is suggestive of bile acid diarrhea in dogs. So I would like to thank Jan Sugrowski and Shi Sung Sung, who has uh, done, run the bile acid um, profiles in these dogs, and Folke the Boxer. And he also has an Instagram called Folke the Boxer. And these are some of my dogs responding to uh, cholestyramine or other bile acid sequestrants. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you.